Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Very happy to be here today. Um, how many of you guys like to use your notes in your phone? Not many people? <laughs> well, I, I know that this is something that I used to do a lot. Um, I was trying to figure out what exactly do I want to speak about today. I was praying about it. And I decided to go into my notes because I haven't used my notes in a few years. And I found a note that I wrote January 2020. Pastor Peter was preaching a sermon in 1 Timothy. And um, I read my notes. And evidently in the note, I wrote down exactly what I wanted to preach the next time I would have the chance to preach. It's three years later. And I decided, I was like, oh, then this is exactly what I want to do. I'm going to create a series based on what inspired me when I listened to Pastor Peter's sermon. So a little plug here. I went on JesusTheAnswer.info, and I went to uh, Pastor Peter's database of his Bible studies, and I went specifically to that message that he was um, preaching on, and as I listened to it, as we all <clears throat> are always aware, he comes in with such passion and, and fervor, and it's awe-inspiring to be able to hear that ferocity in his voice, that's, that holy boldness that he always claims to to have and talk about so it inspired me to want to create a series based on what inspired me when I listened to it and um, it's on a new creation and I wrote down new creation week one put on Christ ingrained not train all God I'll explain what that means in a little bit So, um, I'm going to read a verse that is where this whole entire um, series stems from. So, next slide. This is 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is the basis of the entire series. Not, to, not specifically this week's message, but on the entire series as a whole. This is what it's based off of. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, if you know anything about me, that is one of my favorite verses of all time. Um, I even bought a, a leather jacket, I, I believe, a year or two ago, and um, I have I had a phoenix printed on the back of it with the the verse Second Corinthians five seventeen. And I can't even tell you how many times I've walked on the bus, walked to school, been in school, and people ask me. What, what is that? And I have the ability now to actually say, oh, this is the verse, and this is why the picture is associated with that verse. So I have a little small seed that's sown every time I talk about it. And I, I love it because it's a conversation piece, and it's just a piece of fashion. But um, that verse personally inspires me for many, many reasons. But one of the main reasons that I make it my favorite passage is because it talks about this amazing change that we as Christians receive when we turn to a life of Christ. So living like Christ is basically the greatest change that you'll ever receive. A person's entire outlook on life, their behaviors, and their personality is now filtered with Christ. And that was never as it was before. That's why usually when somebody becomes a new Christian, you should see that instant change in their life. You should see something different about them. And that difference is they've now gotten rid of their old ways and took on the new ways and that new ways is Christ and Christ by himself is holy and pure and righteous and so take, adopting those characteristics should make you a completely different person than you were before. Now the Apostle Paul talks about this topic many many times. He writes many um, letters to uh, the church in uh, um, Col the Colossians, the, the Galatians, Ephesians, he writes about this topic many times. But he writes specifically to the Colossians about them needing to be united in love in order for them to better know Christ. So he writes in Colossians chapter 3 that these people need to set their eyes on things above and not in things of this world. Um, he tells you to get rid of all the negativity and all the things that the world provides in order for you to put on Christ. So we turn to Colossians 3 verses 12 to 14, which is the main key verses of this message. So you can turn to the next slide. 
it's, it's nice saying. <laughs> so therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So this verse, well, this passage, but specifically this first verse in, in verse 12, it, it starts with an amazing encouragement that we are God's chosen people. And that phrase should mean so much to us because it lets us know just how much God wants to have a relationship with us. And that when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we get to be called sons and daughters of God, meaning that we are a chosen family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, not tied together by blood or by background or from anything from this world. We're tied to something that is eternal, whose ties defy common sense. Because how could I claim to love this stranger just as much as I love my own family when I have no earthly ties to them? The answer is simple because they are my sibling in Christ. So not only that, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are also covered by his holy blood, which by his efforts alone, allow us to be seen as holy in God's eyes. Because there's nothing that we do that is seen or deemed worthy or righteous, because as we discussed before, I believe uh, Sister Audrey talked about it, they're filthy rags, and they cannot gain us entry into heaven. So it's through Jesus' blood that makes us be deemed and seen as holy in God's eyes. And so lastly, in that portion of the verse, it says that we are dearly loved. Now, I don't know about you, but hearing that I'm dearly loved by God, the creator of the universe, the one that made all things, the one that made humans special in his image, and he sees me as whole, uh, not in holy sight, he sees me as loved and deeply loved. So much so that when we were sinners and an enemy of God, Jesus took our sin and our punishment and he died on our behalf. And he allowed us to be free and choose a life that is free and free to know him intimately. So again, just that beginning of, of verse 12 hits you so hard. And I, again, even more so when you have to put into perspective just how merciful, loving, and gracious God is to us. Our human minds find it so difficult to even forgive someone that means a lot to us. If your siblings do something that hurts you, your friends do something that hurts you, your parents do something that hurts you, you will hold a grudge. We talked about it in previous weeks. That grudge is, is hard to let go of. And then finally, when you, you begrudgingly forgive them, because they're like, oh, that's, that's the, the Christian way, that's the godly way, I have to forgive. God says, don't let your, don't, son. So you always find it hard but Christ forgave everyone, the whole world, and he did it on a public display. This sacrifice that we all feel and we all talk about, even to this day, even though it happened a long time ago, is a sacrifice of an incredible magnitude, where it seems insane, especially since it was done for all mankind, including those that hated him and us who were considered enemies. Now I could go on and on about that specific topic, but what I'm trying to say is if you take that perspective of how incredible that sacrifice was and how merciful, loving, and gracious he is, it paints a clear picture of the kind of qualities, the selfless and indescribable love that Christ has that we would want to adopt when we get rid of our old self and choose to copy Christ. Now I'm going to get to the point of the message which is where we get the command. The command about what is our part, knowing all of that. Knowing what we just said, knowing that we are God's chosen people, knowing that we are holy and beloved, what is our part? We have to clothe ourselves. That is an action. I don't know about you, but I don't have the ability to just wake up one morning, walk into my closet, leave my closet, and be fully clothed. It's impossible. I can't just say, you know what? I'm going to wake up one day. I don't feel like getting dressed. I'm going to just imagine myself wearing a suit, walk down the stairs, exit the house, and get to church wearing a suit. No, this, this took effort. Not a lot of effort, because it's not perfect. 
but it took effort. I had to willingly get up out of bed. I had to willingly find clothes. I had to put those clothes on. Well, no, I had to take off clothes, put the clothes on, and then be fully dressed in a new outfit. That took work. So what are we supposed to be putting on? It says we're supposed to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. All positive things, but they're not material things. Why is that? Because the Bible says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Amen. So what he's looking for is not for you to try to fool everyone around you, saying, I'm wearing this suit, so I must be holy. Mm -hmm. Pastor Peter always says, wearing a three-piece suit, holding a Bible, does not make you a Christian. Does not make you, it's your heart. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about this later in the, in, the, in the message, but we know that these positive things are from Christ and not our own. But how do we know that? When we learn what exactly we need to take off and what we need to put on just a few verses prior to that passage. Next slide. So the Apostle Paul just says, remember, ours was 12 to 14. This is now 8 to 10. So this is just a few verses prior. He says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have been taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. What a punch in the gut that passage is. Because how clear could this be? It says we are supposed to take off these things before we put on Christ. Now, if I wanted to go into a store and purchase a suit, or if you had to go into the store and purchase a dress, you wouldn't go into the store, get the clothes, go into the dressing room, and then put on top of your clothes. That wouldn't make any sense. You have to take off what you're wearing to then put on this new thing, because you know you're coming into the store wearing your dirty, worn-in clothes. You need to take it off to put on this new, prim, proper clothing that, you're, that you just want to try on. Because you need to take something dirty off to put something clean on. Now there's so many examples of how to put that into perspective, but I'm just gonna have you guys imagine something. Lots of us have bought fruits in our lifetime. So imagine you go to the grocery store and you buy uh, a bunch of oranges, okay? So you took a bunch of oranges from the grocery store, you came back to the house, put it in a bowl, put it on the dining room table, and then left. A week later, you realize, I haven't eaten any of those oranges. You go back to that table, what happened to those oranges? They're starting to go bad, starting to mold, starting to get, starting to see color that's not orange. And so you think to yourself, hmm, I should probably get some new oranges. I didn't get to eat these. Now you're, you're given a choice, really. Throw out those oranges or not throw out those oranges. And almost all of us will throw out those oranges. But let's say you don't. Let's say you think to yourself, ah, the answer to my problem is to buy new oranges. So you go to the store, buy some more oranges, go back to the house, and dump those new oranges on top of that bowl. <laughs> what, what sense is that? But what happens when you do that? You, you came in with new oranges, which are not moldy, but give it a few days. What happens? All that mold spreads to all the new oranges. So you've corrupted the pure things that you had just bought because you had never gotten rid of the thing that was corrupted. Now, Christ is not like that. I'm not trying to assume that, I'm not trying to correlate that. I'm just saying his qualities cannot be corrupt. Why is that? Because his attributes are pure and holy and only possible to be displayed after we get rid of our old self and practices. So try to picture a, a, a clear, pure water. So if you ever went painting before, you have a, a cup of water. What do you use that cup of water for? To, to wash the paintbrushes. So let's imagine, we have a clear cup of water. We start off, it's a nice color, nice clean, but we take this paintbrush that we have, which was again, Nice and clean, not used. What do you use this paintbrush for? Dip it into different colors. What do you do then with it? Dip it into the, um, the jar. Clean it up. Paintbrush, maybe now a little cleaner, but what happens to this cup now? Now the cup 
the jar now has paint marks on it. The water now is muddied with different colors. And now every single time you take the paper out, put it back in, it gets less and less clean. It started out clean, but now because I keep rubbing it into muddy water, the paintbrush now is starting to look bad too. Mm -hmm. So what are you supposed to do? Again, do you think to yourself, you know what? This water is muddy. Let me just pour some fresh new water from the sink. But if you just pour it into the cup as is, is that water going to be clean? No, you have to pour everything out. So that jar that we are using has paint marks. So how could you ever pour clean water into it and expect it to stay clean? There's paint marks on the jar, there's stains on the brush, brush and there's existing muddy water. So all that muddy water would just muddy the new water. So we have to empty it all and then clean the entire jar, clean the entire brush to prepare for this new water we're about to pour into it. So unlike God, our hearts and our, our heart and our intentions can be corrupt, just like the jar, the brush, and the water. So if we stray from following only God, then we fall prey to the lies of the world. We are told that we cannot serve two masters in Matthew 6, 24. Now this specific verse talks about how uh, about God and money, but we can broaden the idol of money to just the idol of the world, since money is an idol of the world, so it's a broader discussion. So this is how the verse begins. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So we cannot possibly obey the world and its corrupt attributes, and then at the same time claim to obey Christ and then accurately display his pure, untainted attributes. Because at some point, we're going to choose one over the other, and we already know, Pastor Peter always says, God is a jealous God. So just look how his chosen people, the Israelites, fared when they wanted to be taken care of by God, but then also worship idols on the side. I don't need to explain it. There's books and books and books in the Old Testament explaining how God reacted when they did that. So the point is, we're trying to please both. And the Bible says, when we do that, we're neither hot nor cold. We are lukewarm. And what does the Bible say about that? Next slide. Revelation 3.16. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So... We can't go around claiming to be a born-again Christian, but then go around lying, cursing, raging, and engaging in malice because they don't go together. We are told that we need to take it all off, and with it comes our old self, and what did the verse say? With its practices. So we can't say, oh, it's a habit, it's not going to go away that easy. We're putting on a new self. And not only is it new, it's renewed, which means it's holy and unlike our previous one. But it also says it's renewed in knowledge, in Christ's image, which means we're now infused with wisdom and knowledge that was impossible to have been gained any other way. Knowledge that we can't deny. So I can't walk around saying, well, I don't have to be nice to everyone. I don't have to love everyone. I don't have to withhold my tongue when I'm angry. No, we can't because we're not living oblivious anymore. It's clear as day in, in, in God's word how we're supposed to act towards others. So living this way without having a proper correction on ourselves is the reason why there are so many unsaved people that have a bad example of what a Christian is and why they consider us to be hypocrites. They see a Christian and instead of seeing Jesus, who should be the display for all Christians, they see us faking Jesus. Now if you look at the word hypocrite, the word hypocrite comes from a Greek word and that Greek word means play actor. So a hypocrite is someone who is pretending to be someone or something that he is not in order to receive recognition or gain. So in essence, hypocrisy is a result of pride. So why can I say this? Think back to, the, to biblical times, the times where Jesus walked on the earth. He was teaching, he was telling people how they should live. And there was only a few people that knew what he was saying. They had the knowledge of what he was saying, and those were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the religious people, the religious teachers. They had the knowledge that the masses did not. While Jesus was walking around telling people of things that he was quoting back in the Old Testament, most of it was fresh ears to them, like fresh, fresh things for them to hear, but all the religious teachers, they knew about it. They all could quote it. 
That's why they claimed blasphemy whenever Jesus was talking. So those people should have been the ones that knew and understood the message, and they should have been the living examples of how to live holy and pure. We know now that those religious peoples, peoples, people, <laughs> were the ones that Jesus was mad at the most. He did not hold back his, his righteous anger, and when he spoke words, he spoke words that cut right to the heart, that left them speechless and unable to do a thing. And we as Christians, unfortunately now, are like those religious teachers. We know the word. We read the word. We understand the word. We understand the messages that God has given us. They're as clear as day. And the unsaved people all around us are those masses that do not know the word of God. So if we are living a life that is deceiving and not a life that is truly a life that puts on Christ, and we instead abandon the word, then we're living a hypocritical life. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23 which is a magnificent chapter in how Jesus just rips the, um, uh, the, the Pharisees. The whole entire chapter is just him yelling at them. But um, I'm going to the uh, so next slide. This, I'm just going to focus on three verses. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then wash the outside, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. How much more direct can that be? The supposed holy and righteous people in the eyes of the entire world were not truly living as the scripture intended. Jesus came by and he taught the world how to live the right way, but he also corrected those who knew better. We need to take a hard look at ourselves and shake off any sort of pretenses that we're supposed to be holy and righteous, and then check our heart, which again, God says he looks at while man looks at the outward appearance. Now, there is a worldly expression that I'm sure most of us know. So check yourself before, before you wreck yourself. Now, this is talking about how your actions can lead to your demise. But think about how your own personal actions affect everyone around you. Are we in need of correction and where? What we should do is take time, read God's word, pray specifically, and also work together with your brothers and sisters in Christ because we're meant to edify one another. Because while doing so, we also edify the entire body of Christ. So speaking of the body of Christ and edification, the Apostle Paul, once again, continues the message about putting your old life away and living a pure, holy life of Christ. So he writes to the church in Ephesus this time. Last time was Colossians. This is Ephesus. He tells them to keep fighting and do not let the enemy take footholds in their quest to live like Christ. Which again reiterates the message found in that key verse in the Colossians and tells us that we should work together as one, as we are one body. A message that also reminds us of our command to love one another and to be unified for Christ, edifying one another. So next verse. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. I skipped a little verse there because it's a long passage. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I skipped another verse. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, Forgiving one another, just as Christ God forgave you. So a very, very similar passage to the one he wrote to Colossians. And remember, he's writing to churches. 
writing to church in Ephesus, church in Philippi, church in Galatia, church in... He's writing to churches. So again, these are supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ working together for a common goal, but again, there's always some sort of strife, there's always some sort of uh, disagreement, and he's trying to tell them, you are all brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to edify one another. You need to work with one another. If one of you is failing, help build them up. Help them in their time of need, because we are all one body. And I believe Sister Audie talked about being different parts of the body. There's a lot of passages about that, but he's saying we all have different roles, responsibilities, parts, but we all come together to be a body of Christ. So again, going back to our key verse for the message today. Next slide. This is the key verse. We are meant to put on Christ, and in doing so, we are able to be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. We're meant to get along with one another, forgive one another, because God loved us first. And then finally realize that this is all tied together perfectly in unity by one thing, which is love. So my question for this message is, are those things I just named, those compassion, kind, humble, gentle, patience, love, forgiveness, are those things trained or are those things ingrained? I'm going to focus on just two things. The kindness and the compassion. Two virtues that I feel like many people find similar, if not the same. Next slide. Kindness. Kindness is benevolent and helpful action intentionally directed towards another person. Kindness is often considered to be motivated by the desire to help another, not to gain explicit reward or to avoid explicit punishment. An example would be saying, oh, that little boy is so kind, he is helping the elderly person cross the road, cross the street. Compassion, a little bit different. A strong feeling of sympathy with another person's feelings of sorrow or distress, usually involving a desire to help or comfort that person. So you would say, my neighbor has been putting up pictures of their lost cat. Out of compassion, I help search. Now there's two main differences between these two things. Compassion is almost always accompanied with the attribute of mercy where kindness is not. And kindness is almost always accompanied by the attribute of affection, where compassion is not. Now I'm going to talk about um, a story of, of me as a teacher, because that I feel like that's the most relevant thing in my life right now, seeing these things in action. I can say with complete conviction that while teaching middle school students, even at a Christian school, these kids had a severe lack of kindness and compassion. Now many of these kids were enrolled and they never went to church. They never read the Bible at home and they never prayed. But they were okay stamping the label Christian if they were asked. But their heart was truly darkened and it was sad because you could see just how much the worldly influence had on their life. They were constantly being exposed to it every single day, and they would bring that in to the classroom, bring it into the school, and none of their peers recognized it as being wrong. Every day, every day, they were name calling and other forms of bullying. People were making fun of hair, clothes, and anything that they could see. They were mocking people's voices, accents, reading and writing skills, and anything that they could think of that would make their friends laugh. It's very hard to see how anything that they learned about kindness and compassion was ever truly found in their hearts. And the reason I say this is because Jesus was not at the forefront of their mind or their heart. The world had its corrupted hold over them, so nothing they did emulated the kindness and compassion that Jesus intended us to portray. So, in order to combat that, I, I did a lesson with my students, the students that I taught Bible with. This is sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. I had them all stand in front of their desks. I said, stand up, get in front of your desk, wait for my instructions, follow only my instructions. So they stood in front of their desk, they're wondering what's going on. I walked around, I had a bunch of papers in my hand. On every single paper, mm. uh, on, sorry, on each paper was, how do I explain it? 
I put a paper on each kid's desk, and that paper on their desk was just their name. That's it. It was a big piece of paper, name in the middle, blank all around it. That's it. I said, this is my instruction. I want you to walk around the classroom, and when you stop in front of a desk with somebody else's name, write something on it. That's it. That's all I said. They walked around it. 60 students, three classes. Maybe five students wrote nice things. All the other 55 wrote mean-spirited things. I collected it all, I read them, and it was plain as day. They had so much animosity towards each other. There was no love, no kindness, no compassion. Now, after that activity, I was heartbroken. I was the Bible teacher at a Christian school. <laughs> and these were the kids that I was meant to shepherd. I was discouraged all day. I walked around, I tried to get some wisdom, talk to other teachers. I went home and I prayed. I prayed for them. I prayed for the youth. I prayed for my future. And I felt like I was just not the right fit because these couldn't possibly be the Christian youth of America. I talked to God asking why I was put there. Why, he was clearly not present in that school. He was clearly not present in their lives. So after a lot of prayer and a lot of thinking, I decided to do another experiment. So since that experiment, uh, sorry, since that previous activity took all class period, because class, class is only 40 minutes long. So there's only so much I can do. So that, that one activity I just talked about took the entire class. And I came home, discouraged, brought up something new. So I made it a mission of mine to push back on whatever that was the, the other day. So the next day in class, I decided to have a long talk. All three of those classes, I started out the class period talking with them. And I told them how the last activity <laughs> went down, how disappointed I was, and how, how much power words have on one another, and how words can hurt, and how words can linger for a long period of time. And I tried to make them understand that. I tried to make them realize that we're meant to be Christians, <coughs> And we're in a Christian school, so we should have a different standard than that of a public school. So some of those students were receptive. They understood what I was saying. They saw how hurt I was. They saw how important the thing I was saying was to them. Some were laughing. Some were completely unbothered, looking around. 60 kids, three classes, can't always get the same results. Mm -hmm. So after that, after that talk, I decided to say, okay, we're gonna do something else. Next time I see you guys, we're doing another activity, another experiment, because again, 40 minutes in a class period, that talk took like 20-ish minutes. It was, it was long. But I was like, I, 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 can't, I can't just jump into a, a lesson now. I just beat you guys down with the, this righteous anger that I had. So I just, I, I, I try to be nice and, and just help them understand that I wasn't angry, I was just very disappointed in, in how they should be acting and how they should act with one another. So I went home and I was like, I gotta do a different activity. I, I, need, to, I need to do something because this is not right. So I created a new experiment. I, uh, where am I? So again, I did not have high hopes for this experiment because again, like I said, after that talk, they were still not very receptive, only some of them were. Um, I didn't think they learned much. So I, I did an experiment that took me all night. I decided to create my own encouragement cards. So I took out, uh, I printed out on a piece of paper, I cut them all out, the size of index cards, and on these papers, there were four statements. This is the statement. This is something I think you do really well, blank. This is something that I find very unique or fascinating, blank. This is a compliment I think you need to hear, blank. This is why you are or could be my friend, blank. So that's all it was. It was a piece of paper, four statements, blank at the end. They were meant to fill out the blank, that's it. So I was hoping for a miracle. I did not hold my breath though. <laughs> I, made, I made enough copies for each student, so, Three, three classes, 60 students, 20 kids per class. So each student had about 20 cards each. 
I told them, you have enough cards to write for everybody in the class. You don't have to, but that's what I'm saying. I passed them all out, and I told them that they were absolutely not allowed to give them out once they write them. I was to collect them, all of them, before class ended. They were a little confused why they couldn't pass it out, but because I knew of their previous activity, I knew how, how much darkness they had in their heart, I did not want them passing out corrupted encouragement cards that have evil written on them. So the class period ended, and I now have three classes full of cards that I have to go through now. I had to read every single note. There was well over 300, because 60 kids, just five, if, if each of those kids wrote five, that's already 300. It's like, so I had to read all 300 or more. Each kid wrote about five, 10, 15, some wrote for the entire class, some wrote just one. Some even wrote to me, which was surprising. And out of the plethora of notes, guess how many wrote stupid, supposedly funny, or inappropriate notes? None. Maybe 10 to 15 out of three over 300. I can't tell you how emotional I felt after reading everything. I immediately started praising God and thanking him for proving to me that there is good in their heart. The enemy is not going to win the battle. And not once did I ever think that I need to pat myself on the back. I did not gain this victory. God did. He allowed the seed to be sown, and he brought the glory. So I came back the next day with a smile on my face, and I told them today was the day. They had no idea what it meant. I said, I collected all your notes. I compiled them. Each kid has at least a few notes, some more than others. I'm gonna pass out these notes back to you. So I made an admission, also, on my part, to write out one note for every single student as well. So they wrote to each other. I personally wrote out a note for all 60 of those kids. I answered all four of those statements. And then on the back of it, I wrote a personal encouragement letter on the back, about one to two paragraphs. And I passed it out. And as each kid went through their pack, reading stuff from their peers and for myself, you could hear laughter. You could hear them having a good time. And many of them even asked me for me to give them more cards to respond because they might have received a card from somebody that they did not write to. So they want to write something kind back to them. And although I didn't need it, some were also receptive and thankful for the ones that I did and wanted to write one for me too. And I wish I had some examples uh, of them writing to each other, but I actually have some that they wrote to me. And I found them humorous. Um, I have about five of them with me right now. Two of them are anonymous. So it's fascinating because then I'm like, well, these are true then. <laughs> because they don't feel the need to like pat me on the back or make me feel good. So this is the first one. So this is, this is something I think you do really well. The answer, or the blank is, being nice and knowing how to understand people. This is something that I find very unique or fascinating, your laugh. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. This is a compliment I think you need to hear. You're the best teacher at CTCA, everyone says so. Next one, this is why you, you are or could be my friend. You're very nice. That's nice. Next one, this is something I think you do really well. I think you handle students and situations well. This is something that I find very unique or fascinating. You don't raise your voice. This is a compliment that you need to hear. You are a good teacher. This is why you are or could be my friend, because we get along, facts. <laughs> All right, next one. This is something I think you do really well. You make school and students' lives more enjoyable. This is something that I find very unique or fascinating. Your level of understanding and vulnerability and also your style is immaculate and refreshing. I don't care about my style, but it's nice to hear that. This is a comment I think you shouldn't hear. You look super cool with and without a beard. <laughs> All right. Okay. And this is why you could be my friend because you're the best. And now these are the two anonymous ones. This is something I think you do really well, connecting with your students. This is something that I find very unique or fascinating, the very rare perk of understanding students. This is a compliment I think you need to hear. You are too nice for you to let people walk over you. This is why you are or could be my friend because you are very selfless. 
And then the next one, this is something I think you do really well. You dress so nicely. This is something that I find very unique or fascinating. You always make people feel heard. This is a compliment I think you should hear. You give me a good example of how I should treat people. And then uh, this is why you could, or this is why you are a my friend, because we're the best. So these are, again, the same kids that just 24 to 48 hours ago hurt me in such a hard way because they had so much darkness in their hearts. So, just, just remember, these are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. They're still learning. They're, still, they're in middle school. They have a lot of life to learn, and they're also not the best in writing. So, trying to read that handwriting is not, not easy. So, let's go back to the question that I posed Are these things trained or ingrained? Do these students suddenly have a 180 of their heart because of a talk that I had with them? Spoiler alert. With these kids, I've had more than a handful of heartfelt discussions about their behavior towards each other, and I just happened to have an activity after this one. So did these kids act kind and compassionately and with love because they were trained, or was, it so, was there something ingrained on their hearts as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Could be both. Sure, they may have behaved poorly, but many of them have said that they did accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they just didn't go to church, read the Bible, or pray, aside from their time in school. This is why the world had such a strong hold, because they didn't have anything to combat that. I should also point out that I started teaching full-time fall 2020, so this is right after COVID started, so most of these kids believed there is no church, they're all closed, they didn't understand virtual, parents didn't want to go to church, so if the parents didn't show urgency or church as a priority, the kids didn't feel the need to either. So they come to school, a Christian school, trying to push it on them, and they're like, I don't even get this at home. Why do I care? So children are one thing, but adults are another. So let's try to answer this question using adults now. As Christians, do you find it easy to be kind, compassionate, or loving? Some of us might believe the answer is yes. Some of us think a little harder and believe that we want to, but it's not necessarily easy. So let me offer you a scenario. You are sitting on a bus, it is crowded, but you got on the bus before it was crowded so you were relieved that you got a seat. You're minding your own business, not making any eye contact with anybody, until the bus stops and then a bunch of people get on. So much so that the people get pushed along and now you have people standing alongside you as you're sitting. You can pretty much picture that, it happens really often. But you can't help but notice that there's an elderly woman clutching onto the metal pole with as much grip as she can, ha as, as she has. What do you do? Do you immediately offer your seat? Do you wait for someone else to? Do you wait a few stops so it's less crowded and then you offer the seat? Or do you ignore the entire situation? I'm sure many of us probably would give up our seat. It makes sense. It makes sense to, just to give it up because we know in our spirit that it's the right thing to do. We, at that moment, are doing a kind gesture and showing compassion as we can understand and feel the suffering. It would be to stand and hold that as the bus is moving back and forth, losing your balance, it's not easy. And we're also showing love, but this person is not your friend or family, they're a stranger. So let's make this a little bit quicker. You're minding your own business when a person is w walking in front of you and drops something. What's your response? I believe many of you would instinctively help pick them up. Maybe not everyone has to get down and pick them up, but I, I believe you're, you're all gonna find a way to assist them because there's something deep down in our spirit that makes us wanna help. I'll say one thing, as a Christian, I know I deserve nothing good, and still God chooses to love me, show me grace, and offer mercy, and that makes me want to always do good where I can. I have nothing to boast about but I constantly find myself in situations where I can show compassion and kindness. I'll give you an example. Last week, I was walking with my brother in Center City. We're in a rush, trying to make it to um, our location. Can't remember if it was to a train, a bus, or just a location. But in the corner of my eye, I saw a guy buying something at a stand. I don't know what it was, but I happened to linger. My eyes lingered a little bit longer than I usually would, and I saw wind blow something from him and it, it blew off the stand. And instinctively, don't know why, instinctively I took three 
large steps so that my third step steps on that thing that flew out from in front of him. I don't know what it was. It could be a receipt, a ticket. For all I know, it could be a lottery ticket. I don't know what it was. But I didn't read it. But he thanked me profusely. And I didn't know what to say because I, I, I didn't know because it, it just happened. I didn't really think about it. So I do what I always do when I'm embarrassed. I say this one phrase, may God bless you. That's it. I say, may God bless you and walked away. I should have stayed to witness, probably. Probably should have. But again, I, I was with my brother and I was walking someplace, I was in a hurry. So I was just hoping that maybe that statement and maybe that action was a seed. No matter how small it may have been, I was hoping maybe it was a seed. Now I can think of many other scenarios, such as if someone, even a stranger, were to fall in front of you, you would all instinctively attempt to help pick them up, especially if they're a child or an elderly person. You just, you just have to. They fall in front of you, you just have to do it. It's just in you. Now some of you may say, well, all of those scenarios must be because you were trained to behave like that. Now that might be an argument if you were raised a Christian in a Christian household because your training and the ingraining will work in, in, in tandem. However, I've seen too many new Christians who are completely worldly, do not care about anybody but themselves, entirely selfless, self-centered, and they have that sudden change of personality the moment that they turn to Christ. They become very loving, caring, and compassionate as if they were suddenly aware of how they were supposed to behave now that they are given, now that they gave their reins of their life to Jesus. It's an amazingly free decision. I'm going to leave you with this profound passage in Galatians 5 that should help with making the decision between the two. Because, again, we could go back and forth. Is it one or the other? Is it both? This passage speaks on freedom and the choices that we make with it. And it hammers the point that a life led by the Spirit will not want to submit to a life of the flesh. And the concept of walking and being led by the Spirit tend to offer the notion that it is not the fact that we are trained to behave this way, but we are led to act this way because of the Spirit's leading, now that the world and the flesh are out of our system, and we're now in this new thing, and have access to all these attributes of the Spirit. Which again, helps the argument that after submitting to Christ, the attributes are then ingrained in us and allow us to act instinctively. So let's go to Galatians 5. It reads, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those of you who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. So that passage pretty much sums up this entire message. I'm going to just summarize everything we talked about before. We're to get rid, rid ourselves of our old lives, our old ways, our old practices, in order to become ready to accept this new way of living, which is putting on Christ, which is essentially allowing him to lead us as we adopt his pure and uncorrupted attributes that are found only in him and not the world. And then after we do this, we're able to perform all these virtues, such as being kind, compassionate, patient, humble, gentle, and forgiving. And this is all done in essence through the act of love, which perfectly ties them all together in unity. A pure and holy love that we're now able to recognize through the selfless love that Jesus did on the cross. And additionally, when we put on this new clothing, we're also knowledgeable about things and are not able to claim ignorance. We're, we will be unwilling to coexist with the lust of the world and lust of the flesh because they cannot be with each other. And we as humans of free will have freedom to choose. 
But when we choose Jesus every time, the enemy will be unable to take a foothold. However, if we allow ourselves to be lukewarm and dilute our morals and values, to add the world into our priorities, we essentially make ourselves hypocrites and a servant to two masters, which is really just a servant to the world as God cannot live alongside sin. So knowing this, it is up to us to make corrections and work with the body of Christ to help edify one another as we're all one body and pieces that work together for a common goal, which is to edify Christ. So as we leave today, let us hear the word and make a decision to seek God and grow stronger spiritually as we strive to properly portray Christ so that every single person can be able to live up to the expectations that Jesus has for his followers. And those are people who love him, serve him, and follow him. I pray God uplifts your spirit and you all take encouragement with this message as it is one of truth and conviction, but also one of true joy as we have all that we ever need in Jesus. And he is always there to help lead us and guide us even when we stumble. Now when I read today's um, Bible verse, if you have the, the Bible Gateway app, what was the verse of the day? Psalm 32, 8. I'll instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou should go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Trust in his leading. And remember that we trust. No, sorry. I went to my next statement. I'll instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou should go. I will guide thee with mine eye. That was the verse. So that verse, trust in his leading. And remember that we're never alone in this fight of life. So let us take heart. Let's pray.